So we got to, um, let's see, ready? Okay. We got to this stage where the theory only applies to individual, to combinations, to portfolios. We're talking about stuff on that cloud there. Um, and of course, individual assets are going to lie above it. They're going to have a higher level of risk. So what Sharp next did was say, well, you can relate the degree of uh, return for an individual asset to, its, to the systematic risk because the investment you're looking at, investment I, can be part of another portfolio, G. So imagine I is IBM and G is a portfolio containing, containing IBM, CSR and uh, BHP. Then you can add addi additional amounts of money in I alone and lessen the portfolio overall. So if you had alpha equal to 1 in this weighting, you'd only be investing in IBM. If you had alpha equal to zero, you'd still be investing a bit in IBM because IBM is part of the portfolio. You'd need to have alpha being negative to have no investment in IBM. So on the, only, the only point which is efficient is alpha is equal to zero. So what you get, pardon me, is that sort of thing. There's I, which might be IBM. There's G dash, which has got absolutely no investment in IBM. And that's G, which has an investment in IBM as part of a portfolio neither more nor less. There's your efficient combination. And there's the single investment, like IBM shares. So this is effectively the market return, and that is an individual share. So I think you can see where this is leading. This is how you derive the, the, the uh, capital asset market line equation, the expected return. Of a given asset is therefore going to be the, the uh, riskless return plus the beta, times the gap between the return on that individual portfolio and the riskless return. And that bit there, pardon me, let's go back up again, that, that, that combination, the correlation of an individual asset with the overall portfolio multiplied by the standard deviation of the return of the individual portfolio divided by the standard deviation of the, of the, the share divided by that of the portfolio multiplied by the gap between the portfolio which is efficient and the riskless rate of return, that's the return on a single asset. That's what all the betas are about, calculating betas in the marketplace. So what you get is that sort of argument. There's the market return, there's the return on some combination, so the further out you get, there's the riskless return, you get that that's your P, the further out you go the higher return you get and the slope of the line is beta. So you get a higher return if you invest in, for, in assets that are more correlated to the trade cycle, they'll go up and down more. So you can, you can get a classic idea of a return between risk, a, a trade-up between risk and return. So you can, by choosing an efficient portfolio, you minimise the risk from a specific asset, but you don't isolate yourself from the systematic risk overall. So you therefore say prices for shares adjust to how responsive those shares are to the cycle and to the trade cycle. So assets which don't vary at all, you know, the same rate of return no matter what, you're in a boom or a bust, they're going to give you the riskless rate of return. Ones which actually give you a bigger return during a boom but worse during a slump, they'll give you higher rates of return but higher volatility as well. So it's the whole risk return trade-off idea and you then get the argument that you can then value a firm independent of the debt level using Medigliani Miller, blah, blah, blah. Um, you get the whole argument that investors focus on fundamentals. They're simply looking at risk return trade-offs and choosing the best risk return trade-off for their overall uh, both desire, desire for returns and their own personalities. Now, all that works as long as there is such a thing as a common pure rate of interest and investors all have the same beliefs. And fortunately, again, looking in the literature, you can sometimes find where even people like Sharp admit that they've got a bit of a qualm about the theory. Now, here's, qualm, here's the qualm being expressed. People often have passionately hold the beliefs that aren't universal at all. So that somebody selling IBM may believe that it's overvalued. The person buying it thinks it's undervalued, otherwise it wouldn't be trade. So he said, what if you actually take this into account? What if you try to then bring in the fact that people don't have homogenous expectations? What happens? Look at this. I'd like to be disastrous in terms of the usability of the theory. 
And what's the disaster? Well, capital asset market line doesn't exist. Instead, you might get a, a curvilinear structure. There's no single optimal portfolio. And therefore, the not only capital market line goes, but even the security market line goes. The theory is a shambles. Now he's realistically admitting what happens when you take into account the fact that the assumptions aren't true. Now again, this is the sort of stuff you should be seeing in your finance textbooks, but you don't, which is why I get you to read the originals. Now, despite those qualms, and Sharp, by the way, I, I actually gave him some credit for that until I read a, a paper he, well, not a paper, an interview with him with a number of other Nobel Prize winners before the financial crisis, and he was completely dismissive of anybody who criticised the theory and, and critical of anybody who got results that didn't match the theory. So I've, I've taken back my uh, uh, belief that he had a certain amount of merit but let's see, why did it actually, it's obviously a nonsense theory. When you look at it properly, there's something seriously wrong about it. But how did it manage to get away with uh, succeeding for so long? Well, it basically argued that the price of shares now accurately reflects the earnings those shares are going to get in the future with a bit of volatility. And that shares that give you a high return now are going to be more strongly correlated with the trade cycle. So you're paying a price. You get a higher return, but you pay the price in high volatility. And you just choose this trade off between the two. And the initial research found that positive correlation. Now, I'm going to go into, I'm going to jump straight to this after I finish the particular set of slides, but I think you'll see they're actually a fluke. Let's take a look. So if you look at the Dow Jones over the long term, this is uh, obviously data that's uh, pretty old, 1995. I haven't included the rest. Actually, I'll change that chart before the next lecture. This is the sort of thing I do when I realize I haven't updated a slide properly. So I've got data going through to 2012 now, so I'll include that. That's the overall trend of the Dow Jones in raw points terms. And uh, if you look more carefully at it, what you find looking in a log scale, of course it was perfectly smooth that it'd be a straight line all the way. Now obviously there's pretty massive deviations from it. And his paper, Sharp's paper was published in 1964. Let's locate that on the chart. At that stage, haven't he spot on the long-term trend? And the research, the numerical research they did was between 1950 and the early 1960s. Now again, as I'll show you later on in the course, that's a period that Hyman Minsky called the period of financial tranquility or robust finance, when debt levels were actually quite low and there wasn't a lot of speculation. But as, the, as time went on, there's more and more speculation and less and less people alive who experienced the Great Depression. The whole period of steady growth, high employment, low inflation, much better than the best situation that applied before the current crisis began. So unemployment back in the States then Normally, it didn't go much above 4%. During a slump, it would go above that area, but there were certainly long periods of unemployment below 4%. And what you find is, about four years after the end of the Second World War, the Dow Jones hit 175 points. You know it's about 12,000 points right now. And then, 15 years later, it was just on the edge of hitting 1,000 points, which is a pretty large increase over 17 years. And that kept on going for another two years after Sharpe's paper was published. But then there was a whole long period where stock prices went nowhere. We're taking a look at a longer period. This is 1965 to 82. In 1965, it cracked 900 points. But seven years later, it was still below 900. So in nowhere, in nominal terms, let alone inflation adjusted, and back then inflation was higher than it is now. So they're falling in real terms. And then in November 17, 1972, it, for the very first time, it hit through 1,000 points. And then it peaked at 1,052 a couple of months later. And then it fell 45% in 23 months. None of this is supposed to happen, according to CAPM, by the way. A bit of overall volatility, but not a huge reversal like that. And there was seven years of more stagnation, and then it took off again. 
So let's, I'm now going to show you a fit to the data of a simple exponential function saying share prices in 1915 raised to some power gives me the best possible fit I can to the data. And that's the straight line you can see there. The blue line are the actual returns going forward to right till, uh, what, 2000 and, no, not in, yeah, about 2000 that's going forward to. And what I've done is the extra, extra dotted bit has been up to 2008. It's all over the place since then. But the fit is for the data to 1999. And you can see it's got a pretty high correlation with a simple exponential return, a correlation of 0.9 over that length of time, despite the big ups and downs. Now, that was the period when Sharp wrote his paper. The data he looked at was that range across there. So that red line is actually what all the empirical work on the CAPM that said the CAPM works was actually fitting to, which as you can see is a much higher rate of return than the average for the entire period of time. And during that time, according to Minsky, that was a very tranquil time in the American economy. He actually dated the end of the period of what he called financial, financially robust society to 1966. So Sharp's paper published there, and the fit to the data across that period and shortly afterwards looks really good. But then you had the crash of 1973, 45% fall. Now that doesn't look like a 45% fall, but it is because we're working in exponential terms. Okay? So that's a very significant fall in the, in the market across that period of time. And then in 1982, the bubble that by and large you guys have been living through took off. And rather than rising at the, the rate that was during the, cap M, the period the CAPM was derived, it's even faster. So people were thinking, wow, we're getting this fantastic rate of return. But in fact, at that stage, the market got to being 20 years ahead of the trend. If it went sideways from, 19, from 2000, only by 2021 would be back on trend again. So it was a huge diversion at that stage. And of course, now that it's doing this and gone even lower, the CAPM is no longer looking so fantastic in the data. That doesn't stop most academics still teaching it, unfortunately. So hang on a second, what have I done there? Look like I've repeated that slide. So I have, okay, let's get out of here. Pardon me, I forgot to fix that up. So it did fit the data for a while. Now it clearly doesn't. There's all sorts of holes in it. If it is going to work at the individual level, then those, those realities have to be, they have to be reality. We have to all agree about all shares and all be showing a risk return profile in our behavior. And the market has to be following a random walk with drift. So the only things that can determine its value are that combination of the efficient market return, the riskless asset, and the beta that correlates individual shares with the market return. Now, I've shown you the individual stuff is nonsense. And that's what led to the whole behavioral finance area. But the great pity is most of those people misunderstood what von Neumann and Morgenstern were trying to achieve. So all the stuff they do about irrational behavior and so on isn't really irrational behavior. And I'll show you that later in this lecture. Um, so I want to just now show you We've had a, one, one of the arguments people use for why people varied was that they're showing a risk preference. But there's a whole literature to show that doesn't work. So I'll take you through that and again explain why it's wrong to interpret it that way by looking at this difference between subjective and objective probability. So again, if I give you these two choices here, you told the rational person chooses B over A, and I've shown you that's not the case, people cause A over B. So the first attempt to explain that by the behavioral finance literature was to say, oh, people are risk averse. You know, they, they prefer, as you yourselves guessed at. Um, so you actually dislike risk, you'll choose A over B just to minimize risk, even though you're doing without money to get it. But what was then shown in a whole series of experiments was what they call risk reversal, risk preference reversal. So here's an instance of that. Here's two alternatives. A and B, either you do, A, you do nothing and you get nothing. Or B, you have a gamble of 50% chance of getting 150 or 50% chance of losing 100. That's much the same one as I showed you earlier. And then B is lose 100 for sure versus a gamble with getting a 50% chance of winning 
50 and a 50% chance of losing 200. So have a go at those two. Put them down like so. You've got those two choices, one and two, and you choose either A or B. So which one would you choose in the first one, A or B? It's a one-off choice again, not a hundred times now, but which would you subjectively prefer, A or B? Okay, let's see if I actually take it down over here. Let's see if we go, okay. Now that's what a risk-averse person would do. Who chose A both times? Who chose B? Okay. That's supposed to be risk-averse versus risk-seeking. Now what actually happens most of the time is people mainly choose A in the first case and B in the second. Okay, that's what you did? Okay. Now that's supposed to be risk reversal because you risk avoid in the first case, or the second case, pardon, you risk seek in the other. Risk avoid in the first, risk seek in the other. So it didn't make sense. You couldn't either interpret either in a neoclassical way of saying you're risk averse or risk seeking or von Neumann in numerical utility terms. didn't work either way. Because let's look what's going on. If you choose, let's do the numerical stuff now because what von Neumann and Morgenstern did when they proceeded on was to show you can actually separate out the utility from the risk and get numerical calculations for all of them. So they showed that if you have, what's the utility of, 100, of zero? Well, if you choose A over B, you're being told the utility of choosing A is greater than the utility of getting B. And the utility of B is a 50% chance of 150 plus a 50% chance of minus 100. So using von Neumann and Morgenstern's axioms, they rewrote that as saying the utility of zero is, zero, is greater than 0 0.5 times the utility of 150 plus 0 0.5 times the utility of minus 100. Now, if you choose B over A, then what you're told is the utility of minus 100 is less than the utility of those two options. So you rewrite those using the actually saying utility of minus 100 is less than half the utility of 50 plus half the utility of minus 200. Now you notice something about those sets of numbers I've got. They all differ by $100. Okay. Now I'll show you, first of all, the simple bit here. They're inconsistent because they're supposed to be linear. Adding a fixed amount shouldn't change what you do. Let's take you over the screen on that one. So that's, you start from the first one, you say the utility of minus 100 is less than the utility of that lot. Then you add 100 to each of the amounts of money. So you go from minus 100 to 100, 50 to 150, minus 200 to minus 100. That should give you exactly the same ranking. But if you choose A over B, then you get, notice which way the greater than sign is going, greater than. If you choose B over A, you get that result. They're inconsistent. Now I know that looks like sleight of hand to most people. I think, you know, why do you... Why is it true that if you add that amount, why does it make no difference? It looks like cheating, doesn't it? Well, you can do it in a single experiment, so I'll show you that. This I'll go through more slowly. You have two possibilities. A, for choice A, you lose $45 for sure. B, you've got a 50% chance of getting minus 100 or getting zero. And problem four, a 10% chance of losing 45 and a 90% chance of losing nothing versus a 5% chance of minus 100 and a 95% chance of zero. So I've got the same amounts of money in this particular set of instances. So have a go at those. Which would you choose? Problem three, which is lose 45 for sure or have a 50-50 chance. Or problem B, 10% chance of minus 45 versus nothing or a 5% chance of minus 100 and a 95% chance of not losing anything. So, now A is the rational choice in both cases. You do the calculation and you get an expected value for um, A of minus 4.5 or minus 45 and 3, minus 4.5 and 4 and minus 50 here and minus 5 there. So the neoclassical theory would say 
a rational person chooses A. That would be the right answer in a multiple choice exam in another subject. Who went with those sorts of choices? B in the first case and A in the second? Most people? Okay. Now, that gives you reversal and expected utility. I'll show you why. If you have the option B in the third one, and he's saying the utility of minus $45 is less than the utility of a 50% chance of minus 100 and a 50% chance of zero. So I can write it like that, taking the percentage, the, multi, the, multi, the uh, probabilities outside. If you choose 4A, then you get this overall utility, and doing the shuffling, I'm now saying 0.1 times the utility of minus 45 plus 0.9 times the utility of nothing is greater than the utility of 0.5% times minus 100 plus 0.95 times 100. Now, I can now subtract 90% of the utility of zero from both sides. This is why I've done it this way, because I can just take that particular option out of the way. So I subtract that and then multiply by 10 to get rid of all the percentages. So I'm now getting the utility of minus 45 in the first choice is greater than the utility of 50% chance of minus 100 plus 50% of nothing. And what you get are those two outcomes. I'm getting, in one case for the for problem 3, I get this result. In this case, problem 4, I get that result. And notice what's happened. You've gone from lesser than to greater than. Okay. So there's reversal of expected utility behavior each time. Now again, back to von Neumann's argument, what's seen as a contradiction in people's behavior, expected utility preference reversal, is not if you do it many times. Again, you have the choice of doing the same things 100 times, lose 45 for certainty, or get a 50% chance of that outcome. And ditto the same for the second problem. Again, I'll take you through quickly because it's um, it will take rather longer to do it. What you find is if you play the game, then you in A you lose 4,500 versus B losing 5,000. In 6 you lose 450 versus they're losing 500. So the sensible choice in both cases is A, you lose less money. If you actually work it out carefully and rationally, that's the right thing to do. So again, this whole idea of, of preference reversal and risk reversal and so on, it's just misreading von Neumann and Morgenstern. Okay. So again, the whole theory is just built on the wrong, even the critical theory is built on the wrong foundations. So what they're talking about is only valid if you do repeated choices. It wasn't devised to handle one-off choices, and therefore if you apply it to one-off choices, you will get what appears to be reversals. But what we're looking at is, can you actually apply repeated choices to finance? You know, If I tell you there's a certain percentage odds of getting a this return versus that return on a share, and you get the wrong outcome one day, can you get a chance to do it again the next day? No, because the market has changed. It'll be a different day. If you imagine if you knew or if you could actually pick which way Facebook shares were going to go on a daily basis. You know, buy them on the day they go up, sell them on the day they go down. Okay? Or if it goes one particular way, you know there's a percentage of exactly the same outcome the next day. So you could always play the game and play it often enough time and make money no matter what. That's not finance. That's not the real world of shares. So what you have is a means of, of handling outcomes under uncertainty. Now, what you've used is risk. And have you heard the old statement by a guy called Donald Rumsfeld about known knowns and known unknowns? Have you heard that one at all? Okay, some of you have. Okay. This is risk is a case where you have a known known. You know what the chances are of getting a, one of a set of outcomes which are themselves known. So if I roll a dice on the floor, am I going to get a seven? No. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So you know that. And you also know there's a one in six chance of any of those sides turning up if the, if the thing is well designed. So you know there's only six chances. Betting on a football game, what's that like? Win, lose, or draw? Any other options? Okay. 
and you can use recent form of the guide. So it's not a brilliant guide, obviously, but not a bad guide to what's going to happen. But uncertainty is when you've got an unknown chance of any of a possibly infinite range of unknown outcomes occurring. So, for example, did Apple know that it was going to beat the rest of the world with the iPod? Does somebody working, I'd actually noticed just recently there's an Australian lab that thinks that they've developed a way of, of uh, blocking the AIDS virus, getting, a, getting a, 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 what do you call it, when you have an antiviral, uh, a vaccine for AIDS. Okay. Now, they didn't know they were going to do that 20 years ago. And is, for example, uh, people producing computer screens like Samsung do they know or not know whether Sony's attempt to build glasses that you can wear will kill computer screens? No. That sort of thing. You can't know that sort of stuff. Will there be a Wall Street crash this October? Okay. So those things you simply can't know the outcome for. So we've got these great techniques that mathematicians have developed for odds and standards of probability and gambles and so on, but they're all based on having a known distribution of a known set of outcomes. <coughs> and the fact you can repeat the experiment time and time again. What about uncertainty? Now Keynes spoke about this. Some of you will get the general theory of employment as you're reading for this particular lecture. That's, I think you'll find it reading well worth reading because he really talks about the real world and uncertainty and gambles in a very good way. And he says, well, roulette is not an example of uncertainty. Or whether there's going to be a European war. He's writing in 1937. Is not, un is, not uncer is, is, is uncertain. That's uncertainty. What the rate of interest will be in 1957 is uncertain. Whether an invention will become obsolete, that's uncertain. He said, about those things, there's no scientific basis on which to form any probability whatsoever. In a simple punchline, we simply do not know. So that's what you should be actually learning about how people behave for investment. That's what matters, not gambles and risks and stuff like that. Now, this is getting to a fairly technical part of the lecture, and I'm not going to assess you on this, but I want to actually, part of the reason for going through this is to show you, you can, with sensible mathematical logic, extend what we know about, what we, what we believe about how firms work out investments to handle uncertainty to some extent. But it actually ends up resuscitating something you've been told doesn't work very well. Who's done accounting here? Did they cover the payback period in accounting? They didn't. Okay. Economists have convinced them that payback is a really silly idea. I'm going to convince you that payback actually works when you've got uncertainty. And it's the economists who are wrong to say payback is primitive. Have you heard the payback period isn't worth calculating? Okay. Nonsense. Okay. Let's go through as to why. So let's say, for example, you're looking at, this is actually fairly topical right now, drilling for oil in the East Timor Sea. And let's say the risk-free discount rate is 7%. And the main risk is whether, you know, for example, will there be military operations in Indonesia that disrupt the operations? Will the East Timorese finally get sick of how arrogant Australians have been and nationalise the oil? Will there be an earthquake? I wrote that before. By the way, slides are that particular slide I wrote before the Asian tsunami. How do you cope for it? Well, according to conventional economic theory, you increase your discount rate. You go from, say, 7%, say, to 14%. Well, let's imagine a few examples here. Let's imagine you've got an initial investment of a billion dollars to build the platform, and you've got an expected return of $200 million a year for 10 years. Now, if you work out your net present value calculations, you're going to have your cash flow divided by the discount rate multiplied raised to the power of the year you're looking at minus your initial investment. So you do that with a 7% rate of return, and you work out what the net present value is, do the same for 14%, for example, and there are your totals. So with all those runs through, if you have a 7% discount rate, you say it's worth $404 million. If you have a 14%, it's still worth $43 million. So in both cases, you decide to go ahead. Okay. But what if you get nationalised in year five, or an earthquake strikes in year five, or military invasion in year five. And look what happens. They both lose money. So you wouldn't go ahead. 
If you only get five years worth of returns, you get a negative return no matter what. So the higher discount rate doesn't affect you, doesn't help you make a decision if what really matters is whether you're going to continue being able to get the oil out or not and get the money from it and how many years you'll get away with that for. So how do we cope with that? Well, that's where the payback period comes in. What you're saying is how many years will it take me to get my money back? And therefore am I willing to believe that for the next five years there won't be a military coup in Indonesia or there won't be nationalisation by the East Timorese or there won't be a major earthquake. Okay? Then you're taking in all the stuff that completely blow your calculations out of the water into account. So what you're doing is focusing on making a profit and avoiding disaster. And that's really what most businessmen are like business people. So they're not looking at variance at all. They're looking at whether they can get their money back and make a profit. Okay, that's the standard stuff you get taught in finance. What actually happens in genuine business is you focus on whether there's going to be anything that blows you completely out of the water before you get your money back and make a profit. So variance doesn't matter. What matters is avoiding negative returns. And avoiding negative returns comes down to not the the risk return stuff, it comes down to how long you can trust that the future is going to happen the way you'd like it to. So here's a risk return calculation using standard deviations. And I've got obviously the very steep one has got a low return and low risk, you know, and the other's got high return and high risk. So Kaplan says that's what matters. Now with uncertainty, this is what matters. I've now got, with the low return, I've got a high probability of disaster. With a high return, I've got a low probability of disaster. Notice most of the red line is on the negative side here. Okay? Even though it's got a high return, well, a low return and a low risk, but it's got a high probability of being negative. This one's got a high return and higher risk, but a much lower probability of being negative. So that's the, very, that's the difference in the, to the two. What all, the only thing that matters in volatility is the downside. It doesn't matter if you get a higher return than you expect, but according to CAPM, you'd be really disappointed if the volatility was higher and you got a higher return. No, you wouldn't. So low return there, low risk, high return, high risk. Over here, high odds of disaster, that's your disaster section. Here you've got low odds of the disaster. So a business person would choose, on the right-hand side, they'd choose the second one, not the first. So the simplest way to handle uncertainty about the future is to say, well, the further into the future it is, the more uncertain things are. You've got a reasonably good chance of saying there won't be a major earthquake in, East, in the, East, uh, the Southeast Asian region after the 9.2 that hit about four years ago, five years ago. But if you wait two or three centuries, the odds are there will be one. You look at the military situation in East Timor right now, or the, in Indonesia, you can say, well, I don't think there's going to be any action by the Indonesians against Australia right now. Give it 15 or 20 years, maybe it'll happen. Okay. So the further you go into the future, the more uncertain you can say things are. And that is what the payback period actually copes with, because you should discount future tax flows more heavily than you discount current tax flows. So the simplest way to handle that is say, well, let's just say, absolutely simplest possible case, uncertainty rises in a linear way with time. So your discount term shouldn't be a constant, like R, like going from R equals 0.07 to R equals 0.14, at the same rate for every year. It should be rising over time. Now, the net present value technique just applies a constant discount rate for the entire period. But what it should be is R plus B times T where b is another number, a constant. But because it's multiplied by t, your discount rate is growing over time. So that's, of course, only approximation, but it gives you an idea. So there's the discrete formula for expected value, which you've done too many calculations for me to bother repeating it for you. There's the um, hypothetical present value. There's the inflow in year i. There's your discount rate. Now, in continuous time, that's what it looks like. It's the integral from 0 to infinity where zero is the start date, of a whole set of cash flows as a function of time multiplied by a discount rate, which is minus r, e raised to the power of minus r times t. 
Now, what if disaster type strikes not in infinity, and disaster never applies, but actually applies at time s? Then rather than getting infinity up here, you're going to get it to s over here. So the idea is try to get the best value for this, given the fact that it might cut off at time s rather than time t. And, of course, that's ignoring the possibility that, let's say, the disaster is like the Exxon Valdez disaster, where not only, well, actually, the, the best one now would be the, the uh, Japanese nuclear reactor. What do you reckon the return is on the uh, Fukushima reactor now? Because okay. they've got to pay for the cover, the, the cleanup cost of the whole thing, or well, they should. So S can vary between zero, meaning it happens straight away, or infinity, meaning it had never happens. So you've got to sum over those all, all the possible values. And if, it's, if you say that the possibility of disaster is just at time s is going to be some constant multiplied by s, then you can, to work out that integral, you get this expression. I'm going to integrate, the possibility of disaster is just going to be integral over t of b times s ds, and that's going to be a half bt squared. It's quite a simple thing. I'm now adding that as my discount rate or multiplying it in. So when I take that into account, rather than just discounting by the R, I discount by e to the minus RT multiplied also by e to the minus a half VT squared. Now it's pretty complicated integration. I'm not going to take you through that. But there's my new expected cash value when there's a probability of disaster, when you allow for that. So that's the normal return bit, and that's the bit that gives you a probability of disaster by a particular time in the future. And it rises very sharply, it makes a big difference to whether you actually decide to go with the project or not. So let's just take a look at an example of that. There's the, the blue line is what happens if you apply a 5% discount rate, and nothing other than a 5% discount rate to how much you value the returns at a particular point in time. So if you go for the 5% discount rate, you're still going to be taking 65, 70% of the value of the cash flows as part of what you calculate the project's work in 10 years' time. But you apply the disaster thing, and by that stage, you're only going to take into account about 5% of that money. That's the difference. So it's 60% after 10 years of just discount rate, down here, it's 8% after 10 years. Okay. So you're really saying, when am I going to get my money back? So here you have two projects, both costing $100 million. And A's got this cash flow. Uh, it starts at zero and rises to $25 million by the end of the period. Um, and then it stops completely. B's got $50 million all the way through. And if you then compare the two using a net present value rate of 5%, all this and also the, dis the discount rate. There's your expression for an end present value. You start at 1, you end at 8. What you get here, the value of that overall term is 362 or 363 million. Now B is much simpler than that. On net present value terms, B, which is this continuous cash flow, is 229. So you'd choose A over B. But if you then say, well, what's the expected value of B if there's going to be a disaster? Then there's the value of A with disaster. It falls to 120 million because you're relying, the, the B, A is giving you more money further in the future than B is. Do it for B and you get 123 million. So you're better off, you could be better off taking account of B. You'd only be better off in the case of A if the disaster you're worried about happening doesn't happen. It was disaster free. So that shows the impact of uncertainty and it reverses the priority. If with that just net present value, even if I multiplied it to 15% discount rate, I'd still say that A is better than B. But with this, just taking into account the disaster, I flip them over. Now that's, pardon me, a mess there. That's looking at discrete terms. I won't take you through that lot. I'll fix that slide up before I give the next lecture as well. So there's the net present value expression. There's the uncertainty aware one. It's pretty obvious which one is more complicated, isn't it? But I can now show you can map from the complicated one to the idea of a payback period. So there's discounts without looking at uncertainty. 
There's discounting including uncertainty to some extent. Now it's obvious that the latter one is more, more complicated. Now of course they don't use that, but there's a way of interpreting B that gives us the idea of a payback period, which is the maximum time it takes to actually cover your initial costs, plus with how many projects you think uh, could actually fail of the ones you take on. And this is the idea of a disaster probability. Now, I'm getting, again, I'm going past the hour here. Can you cope with going slightly over and covering this stuff? It's technical, but the main point about it, again, I'm not going to expect you to reproduce this stuff in an exam or to use it even in your own practical life, but it will give you respect for the importance of payback. And if you actually wanted to make this case to somebody in a firm, you could actually apply the formula I've got in this slide okay, and work out what sort of payback. You could actually tell somebody what their payback period was. Or given their payback period, you could come back and say, well, what you're actually doing is saying um, how many projects you can cope with failing over a period of time. It's a way of assessing different projects. Now, the maths is all on a guy called John Blatt, one of the great economists of all time. But what you get out of it this is this formula that's aware of uncertainty. And what he shows is that the time, this payback period, is the break-even date you require. How many years before you want to get your money back? So it might be five years. And that down the bottom is the number of projects you can afford to have going you know, belly up, not working out. So using that, your T, the factor you feed into the system when you want your money back by, is two years. So the bigger uh, T gets to be bigger when you can handle a longer payback period and you can handle more design, more projects failing. But what this gives you is an estimate for when you should invest that varies given the trade cycle. Because if you have a period where people are really confident, they get blasé about when they get paid back and they're more optimistic, they think less of these projects are going to fail. So this actually explains partly why the economy is cyclical. Because when you have a boom going on, people are going to be having a long payback period. And when a crunch hits, they're going to have a very short payback period. So it's part of why the economy is actually cyclical rather than a very stable thing. So over here we've got an example of uh, a larger payback period and a high proportion of projects you're willing to fail. That means you have a longer T period saying how long you want to get before you want to get your money back. So it's a bit like the horizon of uncertainty, and that will expand and contract depending upon your own state of optimism. And again, that tends to be a collective thing. So during the boom, like the, uh, the boom up to 2007, people were buying houses, believing house prices would always rise, okay, and being willing to take several years to get their money back. Then the crunch comes, forget it, not willing to touch houses with a barge pole. So you get a maximum payback period, the disaster probability, and you therefore get that horizon of uncertainty. And that gives you these formulas for how you can work out, um, put, a, put, a, put a handle on how uncertain you feel about the future. So that's far more sophisticated than net present value. Even though payback looks really dumb, not taking into account the time value of money, yes it is. It's taking into account the time value of money and the time value of uncertainty together. So these are typical textbooks. This is the Wikipedia. Payback is considered a, a serious limitations because it doesn't amount for the time value of money, risk financing, opportunity costs, etc., etc. That's garbage. It's not thinking through the issue completely. So the payback period is actually more sophisticated. It's including uncertainty inside there. So if you want to do calculations where you're working for a firm and saying what's the likely return on something, yeah, do your net present value calculations, but also work out a payback period, how long before we get our money back. And I'll cover more of that sort of stuff next week. Um, hang around if you want to have a chat or not. I'm easy. And I'll put up that web, that link, start putting a web link up right now if you want to stay and watch that.
Yeah. I'm just wondering the readings you expect them to be done by Thursday. Yeah. So, okay, so that you want them to both yep. be read. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Like good. Okay, good. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. The readings. Is it okay to do four points? Pardon? Is it okay to do four points? Oh, shit, yeah. Whatever you have, whatever you study. If you study by bullet points, type bullet points. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. On the way, it said that you know, the readings were number week one. Was yeah. Due on the 22nd? Yeah, okay, that's a week away. Yeah, but you said um, it's due Thursday. So Look, I'm just saying roughly. I don't oh, know. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Sorry about that. That's alright, okay. Is it? Just, um. Okay, yep. I, uh, I have a question. Pardon? Okay, uh, for the lecture notes, the second half of the lecture notes, will they be uploaded on VSLR? Yeah, they're going to be uploaded if you okay. have no chance to do it, but I'll do it probably by Thursday. Alright, I'll be there. Um, do you know how I'm supposed to write our written summaries to turn Pardon? Do you know how our written summaries are supposed to turn it in? Yeah. Okay, when does it close for the first week? What? I think it's the 22nd. It should be on the website. It should tell you. Oh, so you... it doesn't close till the following week? Yeah. So they're yeah. there for the two weeks or three weeks? Well, roughly three weeks. Oh, three okay. Weeks. Yeah, but check, check it. It should be actually telling you on the window. You should see it up there somewhere. Oh, okay. It's crazy that it's not obvious enough for you to spot it. Every, oh. every, every, every single person has asked me that question pretty much. It's actually supposed to be on a window. Um, if I purchase your book, is it going like, to help me understand? Yeah. It? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> it's elective. Bit, it's elective, yeah. How are you coping so far? No, it's, I find it interesting. Yeah. But, like, some of the things. A bit overwhelming. Like, yeah, that's, that's pretty complicated stuff. They're not yeah. really putting it there. Bit of, yeah, yeah, don't worry too much about that. But yeah, the book will definitely help you kind of understand okay. the subject. You, how much is it I think it's about $30. And when are you well, it's actually you can buy it in most bookshops already anyway, but I'll make I'll get I'll go into the bookshop now and get them to order half a dozen copies. Okay. Great. All right, thank you. Okay. Yep. Hi. Uh, this, um, the the um, integral that you Pardon? Uh, the integral, yeah. Yeah, the one that um, was derived earlier, that was um like is that like um a uh, that's the payback period, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's how the payback period is derived. That's right. Yeah, a way, a way, a way to rationally. Actually, the guy, there's a guy called John Blatt who's a professor of applied mathematics. Great, I want to see you talk about some marking things too. Um, he was a professor of applied mathematics at uh, New South Uni, yeah. and he dived into economics, couldn't believe how bad it was. So he then, being incredibly realistic, he then worked out this payback stuff makes much more sense, and then worked out the whole theory of the mathematics to explain it. So that's what I'm actually covering is his mathematics there. Would you like a look at the paper? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think I've got a. T. Would you pop, drop me an email because I've got it on the. I've got a starter stick right. to handle that over here. Pop me an email and I'll copy it to you. All right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Pretty hairy one that one. Yeah. Pardon? I've got around seventy plus three of these. How many? Seventy plus. Seventy plus. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You got that many in there or? Yeah, I've got that many. Um, Variables. I've, I've got to arrange some of them. I've got to make them quarterly. Yeah. So okay. Email with a list of all the variable names. Wow. Um, some of them will have an obvious relationship, which is a household expenditure and such. Yeah. And others might, might, might. Models I don't know that, that I can actually put. So there'd be a huge amount of work for me to put together for you. Um, I've only got around five debt ones, though. So I've also listed those. The majority of them are in the very bottom of the model. Yeah. If there's any outstanding ones that you think I should have in there? Yeah. Just let me Okay, I mean, 70, 70 is probably you know, overkill, but I'll do. I'll look through and I'll probably get about ten or fifteen of them, because okay. they'd be easy. I want to get stuff I can I put together fairly easily. So I do that, and then that'll give you. Um, um, a lot of them are similar to one another. I mean, there's like things like industrial production indexes for uh, things like the mining industry, the uh, retail industry, the household construction industry. Yeah, things like yeah. That. Just things that the ABS produced. Um, Based on what well, there's one little danger here, and this is important to watch out for. You don't want to be including stuff which itself is part of the CPI. You know, totally. Like, if you example, if you included, like, you're trying to predict where the inflation is inflation going to go. Um, so, if you actually had, you know, for example, um, prices of, uh, but, but you, you want, want non-price stuff to predicting price 
outcomes. So monetary stuff, uh, demand pressure, etc. So there, there is a bit of a, you know. There's a possibility for how the models is. The model's output is tomorrow's inflation. Yeah. And it gives tomorrow's inflation based on today's known variables. Yeah, but also, you, you can vary it on like past inflation. Like what I'm, what I'm, what I'm really saying is that if you have trying to predict the CPI, it's okay to have past CPI as an input. Yeah. Okay, and past change in CPI because there's a momentum issue. But you don't want to double up by having other items is independent, which are which are themselves price series. Okay, but if you because the price series themselves are going to be included in the CPI too, so you want to be careful about that. But like you have having monetary stuff or uh, employment stuff, debt stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah. Oh no, just send me the list and I'll do the filtering. I'll just ignore a lot of them. That's all. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I've got some marking with this class, which I've got money I can pay you for from the school. And that is, you know, this thing where I get them to say whether they've done the readings or not? Can you handle doing that? Yeah, I can. Okay. It's, it, it shouldn't be more than a couple of hours a week max. Yeah. And it'll start, I think, um, we well, actually do the ones that are sitting there right now. Just keep a time clicker and charge at the tutorial rate for time. Yeah. And it's. Tutorial rate or marking? Marking rate, yeah, yeah marking yeah. rate, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yep. Any feedback that? Oh, well, it went fine. I mean, just, all you got to see is just see, you know, they've made absolutely no attempt to read the thing. Like, just see 50 words, you know, zero, you know. It's, it's really almost looking into how many words are there. Yeah. And just where you can say, are the words actually made up or do they look like they've got some vague relation to the article? So, yes, it's sort of a five second scan per student. Um, okay, how many uh, students? Are About 150. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. The main, the main time-consuming part with the bloody kludgy nature of views itself. Oh, God knows how. I don't think it would be a spreadsheet. You just get click through one at a time or a database. But you, you don't want to do it. No. Just, just, well, just check and see. All you're looking for is enough sense and make it obvious they've read something in the article. You know, that's all that's necessary. Okay. All right. That's fine. Yeah. My yep. My yep. Views, yep. Good. Okay. Yep. I'm actually going. I've got another.